Um, yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah, welcome everyone to the enterprise track of the Committee uh, Practice Committee with Africa. And yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to introduce our first speaker, I, I think. And you know, he is Madhu Manese. So Madhu is uh, a DevOps engineer at Demos Club. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay, cool, cool. I, I actually thought I mispronounced something. So, so yeah, uh, Madhu uh, is a DevOps engineer at Demos Cloud, and Madhu will be speaking to us about um, his topic, which is basically you know, reducing attacks of his using network policies. Um, yeah, Madhu, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, feel free to share the next present. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me know if you can if you can hear me. All right. Cool. So um, I'm just going to start presenting now. So yeah, uh, good afternoon once again. Welcome to um, our very first edition of Kubernetes, uh, uh, Kubernetes Days Africa. So I'm here to be talking about uh, reducing attack surface using network policies. All right, so uh, first of all, very briefly, uh, my name is Manasi and um, I work as an SRE at Demos. Uh, at Demos, we work on infrastructure design, security and implementation. So yeah, um, for those of you who don't know what Demos do, Demos is a DevSecOps company that helps to guide other companies into their path of cloud adoption. So we offer a range of services from migration to cloud to SecOps on your own infrastructure. And we also offer Google Workspaces as, as a service. All right, so cool. Um, today we'll be talking about security, which is a very interesting first set of infrastructural management and uh, in as much as most people don't like to hear it it's it's one of the basic things or one of the major things that affect uh, your performance the, the performance of your application and the security of your application so um basically security is just ensuring you adhere to confidentiality of data integrity of data and the availability of data to your customers that's what basically security is and um, yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, how do you make your system secure? So there's no, uh, I think before we just proceed, I just want to state this out that uh, there's no single solution to security. Um, you just have to keep implementing layers of security defenses and that would improve your, uh, the security of your system as a whole. All right, uh, let's, let's, let's dig deep into this. Um, nice, um, security. Cloud security basically is um, you trying to implement a whole range of um, policies, services that's going to help you protect your data from the cloud. You know, um, you want to protect your data from attackers. You want to ensure that your data is constantly available and all these methods which you apply to help um, make all this possible. is just basically cloud security. You're already being cloud secure. It goes from, um, you know, managing your IAM permissions, ensuring that the appropriate user has the appropriate permissions to, you know, setting up firewalls, all of this, like all these, uh, they, they constitute uh, security in the cloud. And uh, one of the major ways of, of improving your security is um, identifying, uh, identifying ways which you can reduce attack surface. So basically an attack surface is, is um, what an attacker can do when he gains access into your system. So for example, when you walk into a compound, what can you do? You can, you, you see a lot of rooms, uh, you can walk into any of the rooms. So the number of rooms you can walk into is basically like an attack surface an attacker has access to when he compromises your security and uh, gain, gains access to your, uh, to your infrastructure. So one major thing to do uh, in order to improve your security is just to you know, um, 
try to reduce what this attacker can do. So um, we will be talking mostly about Kubernetes. So um, the basic components of the Kubernetes is a, is a pod or the containers, as most people would say. Um, so yeah, what can, what can a particular attacker do when he compromises your pod or your container? That's something we want to basically know. So um, one of the major things is uh, he can have access to the QBPI server if um, the service account is mounted. So this is very important because the QBPI server contains, um, accessing the QBPI server means the attacker can have access to, you know, understanding what is deployed in your cluster, knowing the namespaces, knowing the applications you have and everything about your cluster basically is available once you have access to the QBPI server. So you really don't want to give him access to your QBPI server. Um, another thing is, um, if the, if your pods are running in privileged mode, the attacker can have access to you know the underlying node that the pod is running on. Uh, we've seen cases of um, what we call container escape. So the person, the, the attacker can choose to you know compromise the node which the particular pod is running on. Another thing is um, you know if you have access to a pod on the cluster, the cluster is also on a network. So the port can have access to you know other workloads and other components of your network. So if you have a database on your network, you have um, other workloads running on your network. Um, the attacker can you know have access to all of this once it compromises your port. Um, one one uh, another part which is very important is data exfiltration. When an attacker compromises a particular port, um, he can be able to you know export data to like another location, and uh, you know based on what. Uh, data he needs and the data he has access to that can be very dangerous when maybe uh, he exports uh, user information or let's say credit card details for example to a particular location so what can we do uh, we've been able to identify you know uh, what this attacker can do once he have access to a pod we want to be able to reduce the attack surface so that's what we said uh, basically what this talk is about so we want to limit what the user can do once he compromises a particular pod so most times architectures are in such a way that um, we have front-facing applications and then we have applications at the back. So your front-facing application can be probably your front end and then you can have like, you know, back end applications that, you know, power those front end. So we want to limit the, the pods or the, the services that this user can, can access once um, our front-facing application is compromised, for example. So yeah, uh, enters network policies. So yeah, um, Network policies are basically a set of rules, you know, uh, that determines how our clusters would, uh, would communicate. So if a pod is in your cluster and you want to restrict it only to be able to communicate only to a particular subset of pods, you know, um, for example, the case I gave earlier, we have your front end, you have your back end, I have your database, for example. The front end communicates to the back end, the back end communicates to the database. You don't want a direct communication from the front end to the back end. So uh, you can take, uh, you can implement things such as uh, network policies, and these network policies would uh, restrict the communication a particular port can do when it is in the cluster. So you can just look at network policies like um, IP tables. For those of us coming from um, a Linux background, um, so we have um, IP tables are just like a way of setting firewall rules on 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 VMs on on Linux. And yeah, network policies are like are akin to um, IP tables on Kubernetes. So uh, why do we need network policies? Um, some people might say, okay, we, we have IP tables. We could probably just uh, you know get an inspiration from IP table and and do something around it. But one thing with Kubernetes is um, the IP addresses are quite dynamic. So your port, when your port spins up, it it has an IP address that would change when it spins up again. And we know from deployments that this, this, this is bound to happen. So um, when you scale up, you scale down, new ports get created, all of these ports have different IP addresses. And uh, yeah, that's um, why one of the major reasons why we needed something that is tailored to Kubernetes specifically. And uh, yeah, another thing we have to note is Kubernetes, um, most people don't don't know this, but uh, Kubernetes by default don't give you all the security features implemented. So you have to do this yourself. And by default, all all the pods in every namespace can communicate to each other. So you have a test namespace, you have a staging namespace, you have a production namespace, 
staging can communicate to production. So that's how Kubernetes works by default. There is no isolation of the port traffic at all. So yeah, now you see why we need network policies. So um, how does network policies just basically work? Um, so network policies, uh, they use labels. So from Kubernetes uh, services and deployment, we've, we've seen this in, when you're defining your deployment or your, or your, sorry, or your service, um, one thing you, you would notice is we use what we call selector labels. So selectors are just labels that, um, that target specific port. So that's the same thing with network policies. Network policies use labels, and these labels target specific ports to apply those policies to. And um, another thing you have to know with network policies is it is implemented by Kubernetes. It's, sorry, it, is, um, it is designed by Kubernetes, but it is implemented by your network plugin. So if your network plugin doesn't support network policies, then uh, I'm sorry, you wouldn't be able to use this functionality. So if uh, some example of network plugins that, that do this, we have Calico, we have WaveNet, we have Sigma and you have Kubernetes. There are others. Uh, these are not just the, the four limited network plugins, but you have to be sure if you want to implement network policies, you have to, you have to confirm that your network plugin actually supports network policy implementations themselves. So um, you also need to be, you also need to know that network policies are namespaced. That means um, they are limited to namespaces. Um, if you apply a network policy in a particular namespace, it doesn't affect other ports on another namespace. Although um, you can have extensions, the basic network policies are, are namespaced. But as we've said, network policies are implemented by the network plugin. So Calico can choose to extend this by adding support for global network policies. Yeah, but just uh, know that network policies by default are namespaced, except you want to go opt in for like customized network policies offered by network plugins. Those ones offer other enriched features for network policies. So yeah, um, this is like a quick link to a site you can use. It's, it's used by Cilium and um, just it helps you um, design a network policy and visualize it properly so you can easily um, work with network policies. Cool. Um, let's look at the basic definition of a network policy. So we're just going to run through how to create a network policy, which is um, very important. So the first and important part of the network policy is the port selector. So um, the port selector determines which ports these network policies apply to. They are akin to um, selector labels on services or on deployment. So the port, the, the labels you define that the port selector targets some specific set of ports and then applies this network policies to those ports. And uh, the policy type, so we have two types of traffic. Traffic, we have ingress and egress traffics. Um, so um, if we want to target only ingresses, that's traffic coming in, we specify a policy type of ingress. If we want to uh, target traffics going out of the port, we target egress type policies. And um, generally, you can also add both of them. Like you, can, you can define both ingress and egress policies for your uh, network policy. Uh, so you can, after you've defined the policy type, the next thing is you need to specify the rule that this policy is going to is going to use during communication. So um, as you can see here, your, your rules can have four four basic types. So you can define an IP block. So an IP block is basically saying um, this is a particular IP I want to limit the communication from O2. That's if you are using network ingress or egress. Um, namespace is is just saying um, I want to limit communication to a particular namespace or from a particular namespace. This is very important, like when you are deploying um, isolated um, environments. Say you, you have a test environment and you want to isolate test environments from, say, demo environment and they are all on the same cluster. So what you want to do is you want to limit traffic that can, uh, that can um, enter a particular port in the, in the test or in the demo namespace. So yeah, the port selector, which are very granular. So this, uh, sorry, this, um, this specifies the ports that you want to target, particularly like this is specific. Um, you want to target a, a specific set of ports on the, in, your, in your particular cluster. So um, when you specify this port selector, 
under egress or ingress rule, any traffic coming to or from that port only will be accepted. So any, any other traffic that is going to any other port or coming from any other port would be dropped by the network policy. Um, another thing is ports. So ports are a way of specifying the ports that we want uh, the policy to apply to. Um, so for example, you have a database, a MySQL database, and you know MySQL normally listens on um, k 306 port 3306. So you don't want the, the, um, the policy to allow access to other ports. So you limit the port that it can communicate to. So yeah, um, as a rule of thumb, as a rule of um, thumb when you're creating um, your network policy, you should start with a default deny all. So what this policy just means is drop every traffic in your cluster or in that particular namespace. No traffic comes in, no traffic goes out. So once you've done this, you can now build up on this gradually and you know um, define granular network policies for your port. So you want to do this because you don't forget, you know, um, any um, you don't want to miss out on any traffic. It's, it's just like permissions on um, on you see uh, you want to specify, you want to give granular permissions. You don't want to give excess permissions. So by default, you first drop everything and then you give them specific policy definitions to allow specific traffics. All right, so um, yeah, I've, I've talked about this briefly when I was talking about isolating environments. Network policies are very important in that they help you isolate environments. So um, environments, a, a couple people or a couple architectures would have um, dev and staging environments on the same cluster. They can have um, staging, like some can even have all three dev, staging, and production on the same cluster. So you don't want a vulnerability or an attacker to be able to access your production environment from your staging environment. That would be very weird and very, very insane. So um, you want to be able to, you know, um, shut down traffic from dev that is going to production from dev to staging. So yeah, you use network policies to isolate these um, these particular traffics, and you use it, you help it helps you like isolate your your environments properly. That is if you go for a multi tenant kind of approach in deploying your cluster. Okay, so um, we're just going to see some basic YAMLs. Um, I'm not sure we'll be applying them. We'll just look at how they work. So I'm just quickly going to change this screen to another screen. All right, so um, all right, good. All right, so I'm just going to share this again real quick. Um, Madhu, I think, uh, I can see Sorry, you. Can you, can you hear yes. me now? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. What well, a good day to have a bad network. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to just quickly run through this. Uh, I think we've wasted a couple of time trying to resolve network connectivity issues. So um, I was just talking about the default deny policy, and we, we, we are just noting that um, you know when applying network policies, you want to start with this, drop all traffic first, then build up on this. So from there, you can go on to you know allowing DNS because DNS is very important in Kubernetes. So uh, the, you want to allow DNS resolutions in the pod. So this is the next one you go for. So as you, you've noticed, we are only allowing an egress policy. That means the port should only be sent, should, should be able to only send traffic to port 53. And uh, you will notice here, we are not specifying any destination port labels or anything. That is because, as I said earlier, um, network policies are namespaced. So the DNS port is in, is in another namespace entirely. So we cannot target it from here. So all you can do though is we target port 53 and say, okay, let us allow all traffic 
from port 53 to go out of this particular port. The next thing you do then is you build up on this. You just build up, you keep building on these existing policies. So say you have a backend, a backend port like this, a backend deployment as this, very basic. Um, as you can see, it has these labels here that just say, um, that just target this particular backend. And um, you can now build up on this and create other policies. So here we are saying, this is another policy that says um, we should allow backend access to ports. So this is, we are, we are selecting any port that has this particular label. This is, um, so if, if a port has this label and it's working, allow backend access set to true, we are going to allow it to be able to send egress to any port that has this tier called backend. So uh, remember, we are, we, are, we are dropping both ingress and egress policies. So that means um, we want to, if you want to create a network policy, you have to, if you want to create a network policy, you have to allow ingress and you have to also allow egress. So I want to communicate to the backend port. So you first have to allow me to be able to send traffic to the backend port and you have to also set the backend to be able to allow traffic to come from me. So this is where we are setting traffic to go to the backend port. We are allowing any port that has this label to be able to send traffic to the backend port. And then in, and in this policy now, what we are saying is we are going to target the backend port, port now and it should allow traffic from any port that has this label set. So this is just basically um, something you can do. So by doing this already, we just limited who can communicate to the backend. And the only port that can communicate to the backend is a port that has this label, networking allow backend access. So you can set this label now in your front end port, for example. Uh, if, if, we, if we just go down to front end real quick, this is the front end manifest, and you will see that it defines this for this particular label, allow backend access. So this front end port now should be able to send traffic to the back end port. And yeah, this is a, a very basic example of you know building up on policies. So you do the same thing for your front end application, you do the same thing for your back end application. So what happens is when, it, when an attacker comes into your system via the front end port, he can't access your database, and even if he tries to compromise your 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 backend port, your backend port can't send egress to any other traffic apart from the, your backend port can't send egress to any other services except from the ones you've you've whitelisted that the backend should communicate to. So you 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 apply this um, this granular accesses or this granular traffic permissions to reduce what um, ports can communicate to. You don't want everything to be visible. To every other port on the cluster, this this is, um, is, is is very risky in terms of security. That's when you're talking about security. So yeah, I'm just going to roll back quickly to my slide and just uh, run down through the remaining part of the presentation. Uh, okay, so all right, cool. So that was just um, a quick rundown of. Um, basic policies and how you can build up on this very important start with the default deny you allow dns and then you build up on this for each individual service we are running if you're running critical systems it's very important to ensure that you don't allow access to every pod or you don't allow access to every infrastructure on your on your to every resource on your particular on your infrastructure for example so yeah um network policies are, are a holy grail in this aspect but yeah they have a couple of limitations. They don't enforce TLS, they don't love requests, and they don't uh, enforce policies on local hosts. So you can just uh, look at this and build up on it. Uh, there, are, there are solutions here. You can use Linkerd or Elasticsearch to log, and you can use Linkerd for the service mesh to enforce TLS and Elasticsearch to Elastic Stack to you know log requests and everything on your particular network policies. So yeah, Kubernetes, as I've said earlier, they don't come pre-installed with security measures. So the additional security measures, which we're not really going to go into because this talk is, is mostly on network policies, but you can check the link in the slide and then you will find other security policies that you can apply in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, very importantly, you want to ensure that you've integrated security policies in your CI pipelines, scan your images for vulnerabilities, scan your Kubernetes manifest that they adhere to best practices, and occasionally you want to scan your cluster as a whole to ensure that everything is fine and secured on your cluster. And uh, as, a, as a final keynote, uh, please remember that security is only important as the person implementing it. 
So if you, the person implementing it, makes your credentials you know, are free to everyone, you are definitely not going to um, be able to secure your infrastructure. You are basically giving them the key to you know, just go ahead and, and risk your and attack your infrastructure for free. So yeah, um, you need help because security is a very, it's a very wide thing. Um, it's a very important part of your, of your infrastructure. So if you need help around securing your infrastructure, you can always contact Demos. Uh, we run SecOps, um, SecOps um, offerings, and we will help you. You know, we we run audits on your cluster on your infrastructure, and then we we'll check where we can we can help you secure your infrastructure better. So yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I think that's the bit, that's the end of of the slide. That's the end of the presentation. So yeah, this is. Time for questions. Yeah, exactly. Wow, thank you so, so much, Madhu. I mean, like, personally, I learned a lot from your presentation and, you know, security is a huge you know, part of like infrastructure and being a DevOps engineer, it's very important that you, know, you pay very key attention to the, to the security aspects. So yeah, um, thanks a lot for that presentation. And yeah, uh, this is question time, uh, question and answers. If you have any questions for Mado, drop on the chat section on the platform. If you are streaming live, feel free to also drop your questions on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, well, let's wait for extra minutes and if we don't get any questions then we move to the next speaker but yeah uh so basically i i have i don't have any question but i'll ask you know can you willing to make your slides available to the attendees because i i think you know, the, the resources and information you just shared is highly valuable and it could be nice for the attendees to have access to them and then go back to those slides, you know, anytime you want. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll be making these slides available after now. I'll be sending it to, to you or to, uh, the, cool. to any of the hosts here. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, nice. Uh, we just have a question here. So, is there a link on how to get started with DevOps? Um, sorry, um, there is no link in the slide on how to get started with DevOps. Uh, I think you could probably check on um, on Kubernetes. On oh, sorry, on, on GitHub, you could check. I like using the awesome list. You can check awesome GitHub, awesome DevOps on 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 GitHub, and you can get you started from there. uh yes uh let me help out and let me just share the awesome devops for you Gabriel. so this is the link to the awesome devops um, so yeah from here you could actually see some helpful links to some of the tools and technologies you need to know as a devops engineer so yeah um thanks a lot madu i really enjoyed the session it was really insightful and uh, yeah and i know for sure my uh attendees are also excited and they get a lot from the session as well uh, so yeah uh thanks a lot madhu and yeah hope to see you some other time man. thank you very much for having me